Hello and welcome to another series of interviews from citiesabc.com um, in my video podcast in Isguarda and as well in the series of uh, distribution that we have within our network um, of multiple websites and um, platforms uh, as well in both YouTube and as well in, in um, the biggest uh, podcast platforms in the world. Um, so this series of podcasts highlights personalities and leaders worldwide that are leading most of the development, innovation, and as well technology and investment that we have around the areas of the fourth industrial revolution, society 5.0, and as well a lot of areas specifically in the areas of blockchain and AI. We try to highlight founders, investors, and profiles of leaders and as well government personalities that are changing the world, creating things and thinking out of out of the box but as well other solutions that actually can actually enable our cities and our citizens to get new solutions that can actually enable and reinvent our narratives and our visions and as well come up with solutions for the problems that we are facing citiesabc.com was created uh, recently as a new platform for highlighting solutions for cities and like the name cities abc is a platform to promote uh, different people around the world that are doing different things in cities because cities are the biggest drivers of the world economy and where actually most of the innovation is taking apart, both from the academic relationship with actually the universities and business schools, but as well, of course, from the investors, from the governments, from the local institutions and councils and all the different things. And of course, all of us are citizens in some way, members of a city or participants in the city. Uh, today, we have with us uh, Richard Wang, that is uh, one of the partners of uh, Driper Dragon Fund uh, that has been partly involved with the, the fund since 2011, so already nine years. Um, Mr. Wang has over 18 years of business development and technical marketing and sales management in high technology space experiences. Uh, prior to the Draper Dragon Fund, Richard served as a Qzong e-commerce CEO and successful open and new sales channel through PC internet, mobile internet, and MCO. He has also developed the franchise channel for further development and expansion of the distribution network and logistics service. Uh, prior to the Guizong uh, e-commerce, he also found Olea Network with partners from Silicon Valley. The company researched and develops wireless intelligence uh, ECG sensors by using the Doppler radar principle. Richard also worked as APAC Sales Director and Greater China Country Manager for WaveSat, and uh, he managed sales and business development for WiMAX and the LTE market focus on OEMs and OEMs and career engagement and design in China. So within the Draper Dragon, that is one of the leading uh, investor uh, funds, and as well with the connotations and relationships with Tim Draper, we're going to be talking about that. Uh, they've been investing in some of the leading blockchain and AI companies worldwide. And as well, they have a, a, an interesting angle between the bridge of the Western world and China, which I think is particular nowadays with all the, the challenges that we're facing, but as well, important to demystify and see the, the opportunities that we have on this. Uh, so welcome to our podcast, Richard. Wonderful to have you here. Hi, um, welcome everybody and thank you, Dennis. Right, um, so it's, uh, I'm so glad to join this show and try to share my, uh, my thoughts and also my background, my experience and my, my vision about the, uh, the, the economy or future city blockchain AI, in, especially in China area. Thank you so much. So I would like to start, um, so you, you studied uh, um, in the National Chao Tung University and as well, you've been actually doing a lot of things and as well as a researcher, as a business, as right. a CEO. So that's a, an interesting overview because you touch a lot of different things. And now you are full time in a, in a fund that is quite a leading fund and as well working with leading personalities in the blockchain, AI and technology world and the investment. So I would like to start, first of all, by precisely your education. So you're from Hong Kong, but you have a very big international network. Now you are in Shanghai. So two very important cities in the world economy and the world scale but as well a bridge between the Western world and, East, uh, and, the, and all these different uh, areas of different cultures and different things. So I would like to, hear, to first of all ask you if you could tell us a bit about your background, overview and education and a bit of an introduction about you. Right, yes. Um, well, it, it's a long story really because I, um, 
actually I was born in 71, it's from 70s, right? And I, I'm Taiwan, it's born in Taiwan. So all my study, uh, engineering work over in Taiwan, and uh, especially what I major is double E. So actually in that time, the people who major the double E, the electrical engineering, normally people in Taiwan were going to design the, uh, like a chip design like some uh, more, more telecommunication engineering, engineering like my time. So uh, uh, with those people, same as me, we study double E in school. The uh, career path for us is continuously to do some kind of uh, engineering work in, 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 this field, in this field. So that's why uh, my background is, is engineering, very, very technical, I would say. Because after my graduate, um, I spent about 10 or more than 10 years all in the uh, technical um, sector to work for a semiconductor company, work for a um, wafer company. Okay, wafer company means the uh, foundry, right, for the chip design and working for the uh, communication mobile company. So that's my, my that's what, because I majored the, the telecom in school. So in the first 10 years, my Career is in this in this area, and after that, um, just I would say, just like uh, most of entrepreneurs, they have for the uh, uh, tons of experience in some uh, like a Fortune 500 company, some like a big company. They then they have some idea, they have experience. They want to uh, change something or create something or for the to create their own business, right? Either way, so same as me. So. Um, and then because the, all the company, all those company I working for is the US based company, I would say. Um, so I know how the philosophy, what's the concept and how the, how the so-called entrepreneurship in, 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 in Silicon Valley. So uh, about more than 10, 15 years ago, so I decided to do some of my own business. So I start with the, uh, some uh, technology company to produce mass production, some kind of a Wi-Fi module. And then um, I involved with some kind of e-commerce company because as mentioned earlier, I was Taiwanese and I was dispatched to China, mainland in China about 2004 by a US company. So I was assigned to do some business work in, in, in mainland China. And at, right after that, I, I live in, in Shanghai till then. So actually, uh, though I am a Taiwanese, but I have about, uh, well, 16 years living experience experience in in china right now okay so back to the um back to that so i start to my my own business but the first one is the uh, wi-fi module company and the second one is the e-commerce e-commerce company um because i live in taiwan and uh, i do a lot of work in us so we know the uh, the things the cross-border stuff and we know what my need the market need in, in china that's how the idea come 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 to our mind to have the e-commerce company, especially for the cross-border business. And, but that one actually is not success, okay? But after that, I went back to the Silicon Valley with my, my uh, earlier partner that we, again, we tried to start our own company, which is the, uh, as you mentioned earlier, right, called OD Network. We're trying to do the uh, real wireless, real wireless car cardio uh, ECG sensor by the radar technology. So. That kind of device, that kind of sensor, actually is not necessary. Well, sorry, it's complete, completely no need to touch you because it's radar. So you can have a one sensor that put away, uh, away about one meter to five meter away from you, and it can detect your ECG, ECG uh, figures. That that device actually is very good to for the hospital and also good for the uh, um, um, elder people's care. So, okay, so when that about 2011, so at that time I was in, in, in Silicon Valley and I tried to raise the fund for my own startup, Audi Network, okay, in Silicon Valley, 2000, so 2011. So just right time, because I need to raise the fund for myself, right? So I, I went to the uh, St. Hill Road in, in, in Bay Area, St. Hill Road in Silicon Valley, right? So tons of, uh, so many, many the uh, venture capitals there. That's why I met the people in DFJ. That's why I met the people in, in, in DFJ Dragon and my, my big boss, Bobby, and then later, Tim Chip as well. So, and long story short, after that, I become part of them. And I was sent, sent to the China again and do some of uh, the venture, venture cap, capital work here in Shanghai. 
So that's uh, uh, just try to explain how, uh, what's the story, how I changed my technical background, my te technical um, career path to the uh, VC world. Yeah, impressive. So, so what is quite impressive about your background, and I would like to hear a bit about that. That is that okay. you, yeah. you came so, from. Yeah, just one one thing. So you came from Taiwan, then yes. you went to Hong Kong and China, and then Silicon Valley. So it's really very impressive because you have like uh, all the different. Because Taiwan has been a leading um, technology development for a long time, but Hong Kong and then China. 10 years ago or even 15 years ago, China was not what it is not, not right now. So we went through all these challenges. And from the point of Silicon Valley, there was the major hub in the world to right now that is China and Hong Kong. So I would like to hear about that experience as well, because there's a lot of uh, nuances and as well, uh, all the evolution right. about that. Well, yeah, I, I guess the, uh, the people in Europe, they may not, uh, may not know too much about Taiwan, but it, my, my time, right, 19, 1990 something, 1990 something, there are a lot of the uh, uh, college graduate students from Taiwan, they go to US to study their, their master, to study their PhD. So actually at that time, there's a lot of the, uh, uh, Taiwan entrepreneurship, entrepreneur, they, they, they study their own company in US. And uh, for my own case, actually I work in all the company I, I work for is a US company. Uh, for example, the, the first one is in Kansas, you may not know, right? In Kansas City, uh, yeah. another one in, in Greece, in North Carolina. And then uh, there are another two in California, Silicon Valley. So, um, so, so that bring me quite a lot of uh, broad, broad vision, broad uh, knowledge as well to, to touch all the different work. Of course, in, because I work in, in Silicon Valley, so I know a lot of the, uh, Indian people as well. So you may know, right? There's a lot of Indian CEO in Silicon Valley too. Right, so um, that's a really interesting, ex interesting experience. So, um, and in 2004, actually, if you, if you remember that in 2004, the in mobile world, that the, the most popular product is we call feature phone. And at that time, still, the number one is Nokia. Okay, it's still Nokia, 2004. And, and I working for the US company, and uh, at that time, Nokia, they have a big factory in China to manufacture the, uh, the feature phone. So uh, we are the uh, chip, chip designer, right? We provide a chip, chip to the mobile phone, to Nokia as well. So uh, we need to come together with them, you know, stay them side by side and give them a lot of support, something like that. That's why um, my US company said, okay, we need to send a team to China to support Nokia to do this, uh, this product. So that, that's how it happened. That's how even why I moved from, from Silicon Valley to, to China. Oh, amazing. And as well, you saw all the evolution of Taiwan as a leading technological hub, but as well Silicon Valley and then China. So all these different nuances. So just one, one question before we go to Draper Fund and a lot of different things is, how would you see the, this change? Because let's say 15 years ago, China was an underdeveloped country and now is the powerhouse, most powerful country in the world passing actually the United States and China to the point that actually uh, the United States is actually feeling uh, the heat and they're creating a lot of questions. So how do you see this, this uh, trajectory, but as well you being uh, Taiwan and as well with relationships with China and as well having the relationship with Silicon Valley, which we still have, which is quite an interesting knowledge and insight because a lot of the special issues we have around technology right now is trying to demonize or actually uh, looking at things not in the right perspective. I would like to hear that, that particularly, uh, how you see that and as well, you're part of that, which is quite interesting. Right, you know, yes, it's, it's, really, it, it's really not easy because I'm Taiwanese, right? And you know the uh, China, Taiwan and the China, US, right? So I feel quite a lot different force, you know, just pull and push and between my, my, my community or, 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 or my, you know, my group, my friends, my connections, my networks. So. It's not easy. And since 2004, I have, I have a second year in, in China. I, in the beginning, I was in Beijing for half a year, and, and then I moved to Shanghai after. So at that time, for example, yes, as you mentioned, right, about like 15 years ago, uh, China still quite undeveloped. So every, everything's cheap compared to today. You can say, you know, okay, I can give some example. If you talk about the real estate, average, I would say, is 10 times, 10 times, increase uh, compared now 
than about 15 years ago, maybe more. Okay. Wow. So yes, it, it, it does. It does a huge difference. It does. So uh, not just Beijing, very, very downtown area. You know, about 2004, I live in the very downtown area in, in Beijing. We call um, second circle. If, if you know about Beijing, Beijing now is a city like a circle. The first ring, second ring, third ring, number three, number four, number five. Now we have got number six. The city got bigger and bigger. Okay. So the downtown is, of, of course, the, uh, the definitely the ring number two is the CBD area. It's the most popular, most uh, prospective area. So I stay there. And at that time, we don't feel, we don't feel any, you know, anything worthwhile to to for example stay longer or you know to you know put all your like say all in now but today totally different okay even you want to you don't have chance that the opportunity just gone right so yes it, it, it changed a lot it changed a lot and i just i mentioned i do see quite a lot of the, um, different force you know pull and push so it, it's tough to deal 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 with all this no, and I think special, like you said, is not just the, the development velocities that we have in the last 15 years, but as well, like you said, being Taiwan, then in China, because for instance, I think a lot of the, and I want to touch this because I think this is particularly important for me as a business person, and there's even a teacher in business schools, and, and as well, my experience is that we have to demystify. There's a lot of myths, mm. it's like, for instance, uh, uh, just 10 years ago when was the financial crisis, Let's say I was working in investment bank and pre, because I was Portugal, Portuguese and partly French, there was the peaks. It was Portugal, Italy, Ireland and Greece, which was a terrible way of calling a country because mm. of the depth. And as well, I know that this parts of the cultural stuff is actually more and more important, especially now that we have so much challenges in terms of geopolitics. But this has been actually happening all over the world. But if you see what makes innovation in cities is almost the the variety of people talking with different cultures. Like you said, Silicon Valley success with all the different cultures working together, right. creating innovation. The same with Hong Kong, the same with the, even Taiwan, because you had a lot of international talent coming and you were studying in the US and so forth. So I think this is particularly important, and especially for investment, because if you are investment, you cannot investment just thinking about the country. You need to invest based on the business value and not about the color of the person or whatever the stuff. And this is a critical element. So I don't want to touch more about this. This is quite interesting. So one, one thing, that, and I think coming back to the, the Draper Fund, so you joined in 2011, which was already almost 10 years ago. A lot of things happening in technology in, in the last 10 years, especially the so-called fourth industrial revolution that was accelerated, but as well, um, all the dynamics around blockchain technology and AI, and as well, so let's say you start in initially your career mostly working in semiconductor technologies, a lot of different things, and as well, a lot of telecom, uh, internet basic technology. So that means 2011, we were in the beginning of the internet, now in the beginning of blockchain and AI technology revolution. So how do you see these technology revolutions and as well, how did you saw this from a Draper Fund? And I want to touch Draper Fund after this. Yeah, um, yeah. I like to talk about this earlier, actually. Uh, so for the regular typical VC venture capital in US, right? Of course, we all know the venture, venture things is from US Silicon Valley, especially, right? So most of the early stage venture capital, like an like angel, right? Like uh, um, the very early stage, all the partners or all the invest, invest, investment manager is come from industry means what means you have the uh, you have the domain knowledge you know what what is going on in the in this sector what is going on in the industry you know what, what's inside the domain knowledge, right you know you, you have the network you have a connection so you can provide them some resource and you can provide them you can introduce them to know their customer you can introduce them to know their supplier for example so for the early stage deal the uh, the, the, the so-called resource is very critical, not just the money, not just the capital itself. Of course, for PE or some later stage, most of their, their, their work is about financial things, right? So they need some, pe some people from financial background. But to be honest, in, in our fund, even I guess even in DFJ, most of the uh, most of partner is from, from, from industry background. For example, we are, as a Drupal Dragon, we have four sector that we are focused right uh, today. One is uh, still the AI stuff, AI plus the semiconductor. One is healthcare. 
One is of course the blockchain, and the other one actually is a uh, electrical vehicle car. Okay, so all, all our partner is from from hospital. Okay, from the medical sector, uh, uh, from the uh, auto uh, auto uh, uh, from the uh, car makers. Okay, company. Okay, myself is from the semiconductor company as well. So all of us is from the industry. So we have this such kind of network, such kind of domain knowledge that we can handle these things. And we know what we are know about, and uh, and we also know what we like to learn about, because especially blockchain is new, right? Blockchain Bitcoin is two thousand eight. Blockchain after Bitcoin is two thousand ten something. This new in English term blockchain come up, right? So we still need to learn or oh, what what it is, right? So we have such background technology background. We know how to learn about it. For example, if for example, I, I study the uh, PhD as well. So we have the philo uh, we have the methodology. We know the philosophy to to study to make us you know have those the domain knowledge. Um, with let's say uh, with, with let's say um, because we are early stage VC, right, and uh, we are quite focused on what we like to do, what we know, what we are capable to do. So nowadays we we still focus on semiconductor AI. Healthcare, as mentioned, and also blockchain. And blockchain is quite new, but uh, actually we invest blockchain area about five years already since 2015. We already invested in blockchain. That's because we follow the uh, we follow the uh, you know the 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 idea, the policy from Tim Draper, because Tim himself actually invest, invested Bitcoin about 2012, if I'm not wrong. So after that. We study a lot of uh, a lot of uh, a lot of paper, a lot of uh, article, a lot of reports from the uh, U.S. media, and we try to learn about that. Study some books. So after that, we we try to find some uh, good target, good the uh, startup company in China, and try to looking for some benchmark in U.S. So we can learn about that, and we figure out all the uh, all the ecosystem, figure out all the logic, how blockchain or even the crypto itself are able to make a business value to make a profit for investor. So we, 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 we just pay a lot of effort to study that and how that's how we do it. So can you tell us about the history of uh, um, DFTS Dragon that became Dra Draper Dragon and a bit uh, how did it start and the relationship, like you said, between Silicon Valley and China and Hong Kong? And all the history, because you're talking about, like you said, the fund that has been going for more than 10, more than 10 years, and as well with a strong relationship uh, uh, between Silicon Valley, Hong Kong, China, and as well these innovation areas. Right. Uh, yeah, actually, it's quite straightforward. In 2005, in 2005 we, we are ori original from Silicon Valley. We have a fund called, the founder, we have a fund called Dragon Venture. Okay, Dragon Venture. The founder of Dragon Venture, is, the name is Bobby. So at that time, Bobby talked to Tim, say, okay, maybe some of your LPs are interesting about China market. Maybe some of your LPs believe the growth of the China market will be huge, will be rapidly at 2005. So yes, Tim Dripper say, okay, supposedly yes. I be, for example, I have a 10, hundreds LP, right? Maybe 10 of them are interesting about the China market. And another 15 of them, uh, maybe about the India market, you know, but actually we also have an India, uh, India sister fund at that time. So, right, that's how, that's how the logic is. So, and then at, in, in, in 2005, the uh, DFJ and Dragon, Dragon Venture, we just JV a new VC called DFJ Dragon in 2005. And uh, most of LP, actually, we we have to uh, talk to LP ourselves and also Tim introduce some some LP. And Tim himself actually is one of the GP for the DFJ Dragon Fund number one in 2005. So that's how it starts. So in 2005, we have a USD uh, called DFJ Dragon Fund number one. And then later on, 2008, we have a DFJ Dragon uh, Fund number two. And then it's a USD fund. And then uh, we have an RMB fund uh, dedicated, focused on China domestic startup. For USD fund, we not just look at the China itself, but also US startups as well. And then in 2013, we have a Draper Dragon fund number three. So we have a rebranding from DFJ Dragon fund to Draper Dragon fund. But that rebranding actually is 
based on the rule, based on what the team told us to, to do. Because Tim also rebrand the DFJ to his own Jeeper Associate, uh, rebrand to his own to uh, highlight his own venture like a Jeeper University, right? So that's how that that's that's how it is. That's a very interesting thing. So we're talking about something that starts in two thousand five. So with the at the moment we were in the beginning of the internet, um, and as well, Tim Draper as one of the the founding. Um, influential personalities and that's something that from the beginning was an inception of the internet inception of blockchain and bitcoin and all the crypto waves and now in the artificial intelligence and as well the bridge between silicon valley and china hong kong and taiwan so i would like just to understand so your focus right now what is the state of the gp fund the the draper funds uh, fund and um, or funds. You have multiple funds, but that's the the, the main one. Uh, what what is the stage that you are right now? Okay, we have uh, we have uh, three USD fund, and uh, two of them are closed. One of them are still active, still investing, and uh, we have uh, three RMB fund, and uh, those three RMB fund is closed as well. So we are raise another two new RMB fund. So we continuously to raise a new fund and. Because you know, for each fund, the period is about seven years, about ten years. So once in, we normally we invest the the investor deal, the the uh, at the first first three years of the fund, and later on we just manage right, Man- manage the portfolio and uh, help them and try to exit so we can have some return back to return back to our LPs, right? So you know, roughly a fund, for example, is ten years, and then you the invest per- period is first the three years. And another four years for management, and the, the later three years you need to figure out how to exit each portfolio. And but but for this ten years fund, maybe in fifth year you, you need to raise another new one. That's how that's how we do, right? So so since two thousand five, we have uh, one two three USD fund now till now, and since two thousand twelve, we have RMB fund one two three, and we're trying to raise another f- number four and number five for now. And from the history, in the past, we have, we have about, uh, let me say, about 10, 10 deals uh, go to IPO, you know, go to public. So for those companies, those portfolio go to IPO, that company make the big return for us. But uh, to be honest, we also have about 20% of portfolio, they just go, you know, just go, just there, right? They just, <laughs> they just there. So yeah, that's how, how it is. So from, from your biggest investments, uh, probably the biggest name, at least the one that is more well-known internationally is Telegram, but we have a lot of other companies that have been investing um, during these last uh, 10, 15 years. So can you tell us some of the companies that were the most successful uh, besides Telegram and others? Um, because Telegram, of course, is with 200 plus million users and independent of the issues around the, the, the crypto part of the investment, there's a huge, massive success in terms of user base, based. And as well, the, the impact of Telegram, especially in the blockchain world, because it's still one of the platforms more used for the blockchain communities and innovation uh, hubs to be managing. But I would like to have this, this kind of an overview of the company's portfolio and what would be the, the main uh, companies that you've been achieving results and, and as well the ones that you want to, um, the star companies that you have in the portfolio. Right. Yes. Um, you know, for some company, they may have the good names, or they have some some uh, some exposures to have the the name. They are famous for pe- for people to know. But you know, for those companies, they were not necessary to make money, make profit. Right. For example, Telegram. You know, we we actually didn't make any money from from Telegram. We lose about three percent of our capital, and uh, we we got exit. It's less about Telegram. But we do have some very good good good. Uh, uh, Blockchain deal, especially in, in China, that we make the good profit like uh, three times, five times, even ten times return. But uh, for those return, most is from the uh, crypto itself. If we talk about the equity, then uh, I don't think we have a good exit right now from equity for from those from those blockchain deals. But for traditional, for example, we have a good return about about fifty. 50, or oh yes, 50 times return from a medical medical company. That company will go to IPO in China domestic exchange this year. That's medical, okay? And we have another one uh, in, in uh, electrical vehicle sector. 
is going to be IPO in China as well this year. Those two portfolio make very good profit for us. One is 50 times, the other one should be 20 times, something like that. But that's not blockchain. If we talk about blockchain, we also have a very good return, but it's from crypto side. You know, you know what I mean? From token side, it's not from equity side. So for the token side, we have a very good, good portfolio called VChain, V-E-C-H-A-I-N, VChain. And you, you can just try to Google VChain, maybe you can find it. No, because it's a big VeChain, one. It's a big you, one. It's yeah. a big one? Okay, VChain is doing a lot of business in, with Europe companies as well. So VChain is one. And uh, we have another two, but uh, they focus on in China only. So you guys may not know their name. But uh, well, in, in, the, in the past couple of years, we do, we do have a very good return from those uh, token deals. So, so, and in terms of your focus right now, in terms of you mentioned a couple of companies, so are you focusing, you have different verticals like you mentioned in the beginning. Uh, mm -hmm. So you have like uh, AI, blockchain, but as well internet and, and, the, and the healthcare and different things. So are you focusing right now making bridges between investments in, in mainline, mainland China or as well global investments like Telegram and Vishen and others? Well, it's, for us, it's very easy. For our USD fund, for USD fund, the, uh, the target will be worldwide, will be global. It's no matter. Actually, we, actually, we invest one Spain company before, one Spain company before. They do the uh, cross-border payment stuff, okay? And uh, for RMB fund, it's only focused on China, only focused on chi uh, China domestic company. And, and as well, in terms of uh, uh, looking at these investments and the way you are managing the fund, so... Um, how do you see the, the, the present challenges with the U.S. versus China and different things? How do you manage that as a fund that is the bridge? Because you have Tim Draper that is a big name in Silicon Valley. Um, and as well, you have, of course, all the relationship with the China and, uh, and based as well in China. So how do you manage these things as a global fund, but as well a local based fund? I, I would say we're still quite local. We focus on this, this, this area this regional okay china and singapore taiwan hong kong we we focus on this region but for some company you know for some startups they they have to be china domestic and the the capital they are able to accept is only rmb so for those kind of company of course you can only rmb fund can support them but for some china company or even some hong kong or singapore company they may be able to receive the capital from USD. So, the, uh, so, 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 for, the, so lo for those startups, that need to be supported by USD, USD fund, USD fund venture capital. So I would say uh, for us, USD fund, actually we, we still quite focus on this region, but we also like to look for other companies from other region, like, like uh, I just mentioned, uh, US or Europe. It's fine. It doesn't matter. Okay. So for us, for for venture capital itself, the the uh, interaction or or the things between U.S. and China actually it's I would say it's good to for, for us, you know, because for some business of some market right now, those companies not able to approach U.S. market, so they can only stay in China. So for those China domestic companies, they are able to get more traction, get more support from. RMB fund, even from the uh, government, do, do, uh, government uh, dominant fund. So, I, I think for us to to deal with the, those things. So I don't we don't see much impact from 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 these things in between US and China. So you play very well on the, these two uh, geopolitical areas. So uh, on, the, on the Trim Draper, uh, I know that you have a strong affiliation with Trim Draper. So since the beginning, actually, and Tim Draper being uh, a big VC himself and coming from a family of VC investors, and they, they have Draper University and a lot of different things. But as well, of course, he's probably more well known because of his blockchain affiliations and defense um, and special Bitcoin, uh, like we mentioned before, but as well is a very big investor. So how do you make that bridge with the, with the Tim Draper investor? I think it's quite interesting as well to look at that, especially being a Chinese right now uh, and as well uh, Asia focus fund. You know what, actually we, we are Asia focused fund, but uh, we also have a team in Silicon Valley. I mean, Draper Dragon, we have a team, we have two teams, one in Shanghai office, the other one in Silicon uh, Silicon Valley office in San Mateo. And that office actually stay with Tim together every day. 
every day. So we, we, share, we, we share only a deal flow, deal source. And we also bring the deal to the team. And the, some, some kind of teams, teams member maybe have some good deal. They will refer to us as well. So actually, we work very closely. We share the, the, all the deal sourcing, all the deal flow, and even all the uh, uh, some, uh, some uh, information to, for all those partners to study, to enhance our skill set as well. So that's how we, we work with the team in Silicon Valley, very close. That's a beautiful way of looking at the bridges and the positive things between relationships between the two big uh, leading economical and technology players in the world. So it's actually great to hear that, that you have a fantastic relationship between Silicon Valley and, and Asia and all these different areas. So in terms of the, the, I would like to highlight because it's very well, well, of course, everything that happens in Silicon Valley is a lot of uh, advertisement and publicity, but things that happen in China don't have so much publicity in the, in the rest of the world. So from, I know that there's a huge amount of uh, development, a lot of innovation, uh, especially when it comes to all the areas that you guys are touching. Um, China is right now already leading in terms of AI, in terms of blockchain, uh, in terms of fintech. Uh, you mentioned payments. We have a huge amount of innovation over there. So what would be the major highlights that you see that China is leading the world right now in terms of innovation and some of the companies that have been involved in? Because I think it's quite important to listen to this, especially coming from someone like you, that has the global footprint, but as well as an investor that is very proactive on that. Because I think it's important to highlight that and demystify as well. Because uh, there's so, if you look at the media, we only see right now a lot of issues. You don't see the positive things. And like you just mentioned, there's great things happening right now. You know what? Actually, I, I may not fully agree about that. For, for example, for a semiconductor, uh, China still has, has a lot of way to go, right? Uh, for example, the CPU, they don't have one. Uh, uh, for example, the memory, they don't have one. For example, the foundry, they don't have a good one either, right? They, they have, a, they have a, some foundry, but not, not the top one, right? And for example, some, uh, I don't know, uh, especially in semiconductor sector, like uh, EDA tool, they don't have one either. So for semi, the chip design, for overall semiconductor industry, actually, I'm not, not, that, not that, you know, Optimist about it about China. Maybe they still need another ten, even twenty years to catch up. And today we talk about AI. Actually, the uh, for AI chip itself, the the level, the professional level of China startup, I would say is maybe just eighty percent of a U.S. company. But what we are strong here is application. We have a scenario. We have the uh, population. So we have those the uh, application scenario that we can apply those technology. But if we talk about technology itself, China, we still have about maybe 10 years to catch. That's about technology itself, okay? But for chip design, yeah, for AI chip design, the, the people here can do the same, but you just do the same, you not do better. In terms of the, uh, in terms of the cost, in terms of the performance, you maybe do the same, but you're not able to do better, or you just second tier. So I'm not that the optimistic about this. But that's about it. AI, that, that's about semiconductor. But for the uh, blockchain, I think maybe China does have the opportunity to be the leading role worldwide. Why is that? Because t blockchain itself, the technology itself, is not that, it's not deep technology. It's, it's not like something like semiconductor. It's a uh, software, okay? First of all, it's software. And it's a uh, protocol things. So, so right now, actually, the, uh, some of, for example, one of the state-owned company and uh, two mobile phone company, they try to assemble an alliance we call a blockchain service network in China. And they try to create an infrastructure to support those developers to develop the apps based on blockchain technology or based on the distributed ledger technology. Because for those DLT, what they need for infrastructure, infrastructure is the protocol itself and also the node, the IDC, the server for the storage, okay, for the website, for those servers. And that's what we call infrastructure. But of course, based on, on top of that things, you need one middle layer to try to connect all the different protocols. And that's the sort of things. That's something I think China has huge opportunity to catch up and can be in the same position as US or Europe. But if you talk about, talk about some hardware, 
like semicon i i think it's still a long way to go yeah that that is interesting and i think it's good that you look at that from a very objective way because i think uh, we have a massive issue in terms of narrative and as well this is actually creating a lot of issues for all of us in terms of technology because a lot of companies are starting to be back blacklisted uh, a lot of fights in geopolitics which i think all has happened if you look at the, the 70s that this would be between uh US and Russia right now of course as a comp as a country becomes more powerful it it creates all of these issues but i think probably i think the biggest issue we have right now is because of the way the digital um is more present and especially internet you tend to go in a lot of theories of conspiration a lot of issues that sometimes take um the problems out of the reality um and as well of the facts because facts and scientific base especially when it comes to investment you cannot invest in something that is not concrete otherwise you go bankrupt like you said it's like telegram it has a huge reputation but like you said it didn't make money to you guys um and i think it's important that you look at that so so from this angle and i would like without going to politics but just from a pragmatic level what would be the the advice that you give for startups or over the world that wanted to get into china or even partnership with you because what i like about your fund and your relationship is this kind of fantastic bridge between different countries as well innovation driven focus technology and financial focus but very very uh, first of all very mature as well we're talking about more than 15 years of history um and as well with leading personalities around the world so what would be the advice that you give for these companies let's say a company that want to knock on the door of draper fund um or draper dragon fund and the, the relationships that you would say that are important when you look at startups or other partners to to work with uh let let me try to separate the uh, the innovate innovation startup uh into terms okay one we normally call techno technology innovation so that happens mostly in your in silicon valley most uh, a lot of uh, startup company in silicon valley they what they what the advantage is technical innovation for example uh for example the apple right the they they have, they have iphone and um for example some other chip company for example some robotic company for example some server company they have a technology innovation and from that technology they create their business value because they are able to compete and able to to you know to catch the market from other competitor who is not that uh, who doesn't have that kind of technology te technical advantage right that's called in you know uh, technology innovation but in china which is different in china most of the startup what they are able or how they are able to get a business value because they have a business business model innovation they create a new business model and try to uh have some creative idea about a business model from and from this that kind of business model they are able to compete with their competitors who are run the very old fashioned business model so they are so for those business model innovation company they are able to create a business value make some good return so with that say i my advice is if you are a technology driven company you should go to the place who are able to provide you a lot of talent talents right so you need to look for the place they are able to support you a lot of talent like say a bunch of universities there right bunch of the good engineers there right that's very good example is like silicon valley but if you are a very commercial company you are not that early you already have some confirmed market proof business model but you want to grow expand your business scale then you can come to the place with quite a lot more population like china like india because so many pop population there right so many subscriber you are easier you are able you are able to be easier to scale up your business so it really depends what 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 stage you are what kind of business you are in that that's that's what i can give it uh, advice I can give you for example if if you are a spain comp startup company right but you are very technology driven what you need is engineer talent talent engineer then why you come to china in china in china you are not able to catch those talent engineer they don't know you right and maybe they have the uh, the communication problem as well but you if you are a well established uh premature or some relatively mature company right of course you can come to china and try to expand your 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 market
Yeah. Very interesting. And I think this is critical, especially when it comes to all the, the major uh, challenges we're facing right now, when it comes to um, all the different... First of all, there's a huge... Um, I would say that the, the biggest challenge right now is the discrepancies between the velocities. Like you said, Silicon Valley is very advanced in some areas. China is getting advanced in others. But the rest of the world economy is still very uh, going through a lot of challenges, which gives me one specific area. So um, being someone that has been on technology for a long time and as well investing, but as well you created companies, you build software. So you've been in a lot of different angles from marketing to product building to technology and different areas. So what I would see is the biggest uh, challenge you see in, when it comes to the fourth industrial revolution and as well um, in the areas of uh, society 5.0, fourth industrial revolution that we're facing right now. So what would be from your exper expertise and as well from your research, how do you see these kind of different technologies independent of the geopolitics, independent of other areas? Right, you know, because I, I spent uh, about five years to study blockchain and uh, not just blockchain itself, especially also IoT. Earlier you mentioned about AI plus blockchain, but uh, myself, I, I would rather say it's IoT plus blockchain. Because let me, let me, let me try to explain yeah, this. Yeah, very for, good point. For AI, yeah. for AI, you can separate AI into two things. One is data itself. The other one is algorithm. You have data and you have, first of all, you, have, you need to have data. And right after you have data, you can have an algorithm, algorithm to analyze those data. And then after analyze, you can decision maker to make the decision to, to tell intelligently tell what to do. That's about AI. And IoT itself is data. IoT itself is generated data from each device they generate data, right? IoT itself doesn't have anything else, but just data. Okay, what brushing is? Blockchain is an algorithm, a protocol to process those data in a way, in a distributed way, in some kind of consensus way, in some kind of ledger way, okay? And so I, I would say the, uh, because blockchain itself is processed the data, blockchain itself doesn't have any intelligent algorithm, that's, that's AI. So I would say blockchain itself to uh, combine with IoT is perfect com combination. And that kind of things actually can be applied to smart city. So, for example, in the, in, in, we, we, people talk about a smart city back 10, five years ago. Smart city. How can be smart? It's not just you have, it's not, the smart is not from AI. I, I would say the, the smart is from the data. And then how you create the data and how, how you catch the data, how you process the data. So, if we talk about society 5.0, 5, 5 of, course, of course, city itself, City itself is, 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 it can be survived independently and city itself need to sustain by itself, right? City itself. So the city need to have those infrastructure ready and those infrastructure, including IoT devices, those devices are able to create the data and send the data and gain the, gain the profit, gain the profit from the data he shared, is shared, right? How to do that? By blockchain. Okay, by distributed consensus. And of course, the protocol is going to process those data. So uh, from, from what I have, from what the, uh, in the past five years, I, I, I pay a lot effort on the blockchain. I think the uh, society 5.0, especially for smart city concept, uh, is a really good point to apply to use the uh, IoT device and also combine with the blockchain protocol. And in that way, the AI, it's able to, uh, create something you know more more distributed autonomous organization you know to help people are uh, able to deal with themselves but in the meantime they can also very uh harmonic to working deal with other other people myself is one no the other people is another no and so everyone is a distributed no and everyone's interaction, not just the, uh, you know, everyone's interaction is based on the data, right? Even our talking, our voice is a data. Our, our interaction is data. So, so based on that, I, I think based on the concept, the philosophy from the blockchain itself, it, it would be very good asset, very good basic for future social 4.0. Yeah, that, that's a very good point, the relationship between uh, 
blockchain, uh, AI integration, and of course, all the IoT sensors, which I see partly as, as, as well, enable AI because the sensor is just a, a device that, that actually integrates data and passes the data to different sensors and different protocols and software. Um, one of the things that is particularly interesting is the idea of smart cities that you touch. And of course, this is a, a video podcast integrated in the Cities ABC platform. So how do you see that? I know that China and Hong Kong and even Taiwan have been much more advanced in terms of looking at the data from cities and smart cities. And you mentioned as well that you're working as well in, in uh, um, self-driven uh, vehicles, uh, healthcare, a lot of these areas that you are investing as well. I know that China, Hong Kong and uh, Taiwan have been actually working on this for a long time. There's already a lot of smart city strategy for uh, special China that is right now moving forward. So how do you see this area in particular? This is quite interesting and this is one of the most innovative areas that is going on in the world. Um, so uh, I think right now, especially in China, right, they uh, try to build up the smart city. But for those smart city, of course, they need to intelligent, intelligence to process those data from camera, for example, from the uh, 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 facility, public service facility, and try to give you more comfortable, more high efficient service based on that. But for those kind of smart city is very, they, I would say that's they're just first one, because they are able to, they're just trying to intelligence wise to process those data. But for the phase two I'm talking about, is those data is just not the centralized control or those data is not a centralized service company to provide to process. It needs to be done by a distributed way because the data itself is very sensitive. If you misuse the data and it's going to uh, have some uh, security issue as well, it, it may be harmful your personal privacy, harmful your, your, your person, personal security things, right? So that's why I mentioned that the blockchain, because blockchain also have the, some kind of algorithm to take care of the uh, security and privacy, right? So that's why I mentioned, and you cannot only count on a one, one central department or one central company, like a central government to control everything, right? I, I, I don't believe that people are going to trust that. So that's, that's how and that's why it's so important to, to uh, imply some kind of, uh, some 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 kind of uh, pro, uh, blockchain protocol into that uh, smart city uh, build up. Very interesting. So so um, in, coming back to to blockchain, uh, I'm particularly interested because you guys have been, like you said, investing in blockchain from the beginning. Uh, and like you said, blockchain has a lot of different iterations, a lot of different uses. But it's definitely, uh, and you mentioned that China is leading in a lot of things. I know that China is right now building the blockchain protocol for all the cities in China. And it's trying to really, like you said, apply because for instance, the rest of the world, blockchain technology has been applied mostly in finance and ICOs and in crypto, like you said, and as well in finance and right now more and more in supply chain and the, some, some kind of first stages on healthcare. So from your experience being one of the first funds and as well having Trim Draper, which is one of the leading uh, personalities in the idea, in the blockchain and crypto world. How do you see the blockchain revolution uh, going forward? And as well, integrating, like you said, in AI uh, and IoT, but specifically in the areas of China, what, what do you see these kind of things? Because I think you're really moving much faster on that level. I would say uh, from infrastructure-wise, uh, China, they do uh, pay a lot of effort on it. For example, you need to quite a lot of IDC service, right? To, for, to, to take care of those storage things, to take care of those the, uh, laser, laser nodes things, right? So for this part, and you need a lot of bandwidth to support that too. For this part, this kind of infrastructure hardware, especially that China has the leading position. And for the uh, protocol itself, there's a lot of protocol companies doing that. And normally they, they open source that kind of protocol. So, for these things, uh, I, I guess China are able to gain some benefit from, from open source software because there are a lot of good the uh, US company try to develop the software, but uh, they open source, right? So a lot of company, a lot of, uh, a lot of countries develop team can, can use that, uh, take that advantage as well. But what the, other, what the other things interesting or strong in China is application because we have population as I mentioned earlier, right? For example, uh, Fintech wise, because it, we, we have so many people, we need a Fintech financial service, right? So that's a good application scenario that you can apply and you can grow your business based on that uh, service you provide. And the other thing is about the, um, the public service. Right now, a lot of the local government, they try to 
they try to uh, try to uh, embed it or try to use in the blockchain technology to provide their public service, including the medical insurance, including the uh, the, uh, the the facility like electricity as well, like the, like the, the the tap water, something like that. Also, like some kind of um, civilization registration, and especially also in transportation as well. And and but there's one thing very interesting in China that's insurance, especially for micro insurance, because in the past we we all know the insurance itself is an insurance company, and insurance company give you okay, that's how I how I calculate. So that's the, the, the bill, that's the insurance fee that you, you are going to pay and that's insurance that you are able, you, you are going to be covered for, to you, right? But for micro insurance, if you build, if you micro insurance based on the blockchain and for those data, it's very customized. Because for example, you, you as an individual, as a person, right? Every, everyone's insurance fee should be different because everyone's risk, everyone's, uh, you know, the, 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 the situation is different. So supposedly, everyone's insurance fee, should, insurance fee should be different. But today, it's not like that, right? So micro insurance, it would be a very good and very big market, as also the car insurance in China. And that market, if some company using the blockchain technology and try to do some innovation way to surface the market, I, I believe that would be a very huge opportunity for that kind of company. Uh, and one of the things talking about insurance is about identity. So I know that China has all the, the, the WeChat and all this different identity around the users. And of course, blockchain is critical for creating identity because at the moment, for instance, we have all these thousands of different profiles online, especially in Europe mm -hmm. and around the world. And in China, you actually have an, a easy way. So how do you see blockchain identity? That is a very powerful area. And as well, it touched, of course, insurance because if you have identity as much as right. insure and create a credit right. score or social score, but in the right way of, of doing it. Right. Let, 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 let's we call a digital ID. Digital exactly. uh, ID. Yes. That's that's also very basic thing for for blockchain application. For example, if you want to do some uh, kind of payment transaction, if you have ID, you, today you don't have ID. You you only have a wallet. You have, only have some code. You can do the uh, the crypto transaction. But if you have ID, you are able to. You know what? Actually, I don't believe no ID things. Because for those stock market, it's really not a good market that we, we, we need to address, right? So supposedly for a lot of patients, you, you still need to hook up with fiat. And in that case, you need uh, the ID. But the DID is going to embed it in a lot of application. Of course, transaction is one. Of course, the, uh, the, 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 the payment, insurance need a payment. Of course, for the gaming as well. Of course, for the e-commerce as well. So the DID itself, uh, if you have a Wally company, if you have Wally apps, you need the idea. So the idea itself is a very basic element in an application. You you are going to see that uh, more and more uh, popular in 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 the blockchain application. For example, in China, uh, China has issued DCEP, digital currency, right? E electronic payment. And China DCEP certainly they will have a DID. So simply, you have a physical ID, you have a traditional ID. But they are going to switch that to a DID, the same thing. So even for China's DCEP, and for for example, for the uh, uh, the the unit national unit, right? They have a, a lot of subsidiary, and they try to support some kind of third world companies, third, some emerging companies support Africa, for example, and they try to give the uh, sponsorship for for those individuals in, in Africa, and they need a DID as well, because if they don't do the DID. A lot of fake thing happen. So the loss that if they put hundred hundred dollar into Africa's refugees, you know that the, the, the loss would be fifteen percent because they the ID things is is mess up is mess mess up right? They just give the wrong people or some fake things, some, some scam things happen. So yes, the ID would be very basic things. And for we talk about IoT, each device need to their own ID as well. So we will know. Okay, this data is from that sensor. This sensor needs to take its own responsibility. And the data provided by this sensor, this sensor is going to get, the, uh, get its profit as well. For example, you can put an autonomous, autonomous car, auto drives car as a, as a device as well. The auto drives car itself can, get the, can, can make the money because it takes the, take the, take the, the rider, right? 
so it can it can get the profit. But the the, the car itself need to spend money too. It need ele electricity in the gasoline, so it need to spend money, but it can also make the money from the rider, and itself can be a independent independent survival entity. You know, so that's future. That is very, very powerful area. So one last question on this area, because I think uh, your insights are very precious because giving your knowledge and, and the bridge between technology knowledge, investment knowledge, economical, and even uh, pure research knowledge. How do you see as well the, the convergence around uh, especially artificial intelligence? Because of course, we have different policies around the different areas of artificial intelligence. And of course, it's touching everything in society. But at the moment, the biggest challenge we're facing is, okay, are you going to have a distributed artificial intelligence like people like Ben Gortzel are uh, aiming, like a decentralized um, uh, artificial intelligence where different areas of open sources and the intelligence have evolves together? Or you see this more as a geopolitical uh, fight between different countries that will have access to better data and they can actually create their things. How do you see this part of the developments around the uh, artificial intelligence and the startups that are coming out of this? I, I don't see that. I go. I don't see that going to happen in the next ten years because for those application now, if, if we talk about AI itself, we talk about data. We still need to focus on what kind of application scenario is. So for a lot of scenario, is very regional even just inside a city or just cover uh, inside a nation. So if we talk about the China, US, I don't see that conflict is going to happen in at least for 10 years. Because for those data you get from those people or those devices, that will be only valuable in that region only. So we talk about uh, for life, for people's regular daily life, the, how the, uh, the AI going to benefit to those people's life, right? So, so the, the data will only have a value in that in in certain area in in certain circumstances so i don't see that going to happen no yeah, so so you you think they'll take more time still to get to those directions okay right. so so last thing and we are among covid19 um covid19 has been definitely creating a massive uh, disruption in the world economy but in one end has been actually creating a huge capacity in terms of digital transformation so a lot of countries that were actually not taking digital transformation serious, they start right now taking it and they're really moving policies, learning, trying to get global experts to help them and trying to move faster with that. How do you see that and uh, what had been your um, trajectory during the COVID-19, which affect the world the economy is still affecting? I know that China managed that very well compared to the rest of the world. But you see, for instance, the United States being completely disrupted, uh, the UK economy, where I'm based in a lot of other places. How do you see that part? And as well, how you see the next months? Because the next months are going to be particularly important for the next stage. Yeah. Um, well, it, this COVID-19 thing is very, it's, it's, uh, it's very strange, you know, to, it's accident, right? People, people doesn't, doesn't expect that, right? And for these things, actually, for those some companies, they don't expect this, but because of the business they are, for example, they do the online education, they do the uh, healthcare product devices, they do, you know, so, so some companies actually get a benefit from this, especially a lot of the uh, healthcare or medical company as well. So that's one thing. But that, it, it does also affect a lot of, a lot of other businesses, like, uh, for example, the, uh, the, the lifestyle, com li lifestyle business. They, they just... Uh, they just suffer from suffer from these kind of things, but in overall, I think you know, ac accident happens. The, the the definition about accident is something that you never expect. That's how we call accident, right? And and unfortunately, accident always happen. The, right? It it always happen. So for a uh, for a uh, for a business for a company for even for a uh, entrepreneur, they they. He just need to have the kind of capability to deal with any, you know, to deal with any accident com coming, and they need to turn maybe turn their direction, or they just try to, uh, you know, to to uh, shrink the company or try to figure out the other way to to make they are able to survive. So, so you see that this is going, and do you see that just to finish on that level, you see this in your case as investors as a big opportunity. To, to take over other companies, to invest in more companies? What would be your, uh, uh, as a fund, 
what would be actually your focus on this direction? Because I think it's a very important thing. There's a lot of right. questions right now on how to cope with this. Right. What I would say, whenever the, the risk come up, right, the, the opportunity also come along. So we are looking, of course, there's risk there for sure. But we, we, what, we are, we, we, what we are looking for, what we are, like, we are doing to, we are going to do is looking for the opportunity and try to analyze the opportunity and catch that kind of opportunity. So as a fund, we still continuously looking for those opportunities who are able to survive or are able to provide and solve, the, solve this kind of pain point in this kind of situation because this is going to happen. And this, this situation may be, become more regular in the future, right? Because there's so far, there's no uh, a such way are able to completely terminate this kind of the virus. So this is going, maybe going to be a very, very regular thing. So from, based on this kind of understanding, we are looking for that kind of opportunity, looking for the, the staff are able to, to adapt to this kind of situation. Well, I think it's a, it's a great. So, so one last question I want to touch, and I think we passed already one hour. It's been a fantastic exchange of ideas and as well intelligence. Yeah. So you mentioned that you've been investing a lot in crypto um, and it was your first areas and because you were one of the leading and first organizations in the world to invest on this. And of course, you are working with Tim Draper, which is one of the biggest investors in Bitcoin in particular, but as well, it's been actually probably one of the biggest minds in the world creating awareness before actually blockchain was even anything. And as well to not only create awareness, but being a, a vocal ambassador and entrepreneur and the, the evangelist on this area. So what, what do you have to say at the moment at this stage of the, we have the ICOs and of course you were involved in Telegram that, as you said, it was not probably your best investment, but still successful in terms of branding and in terms of a user base at least. But how do you see the evolution of crypto in the last 10 years um, that you've been going through uh, and as well being one of the first ones and as well the maturity because now we have Facebook creating Libra and you have uh, global, mm -hmm. actually even Goldman Sachs and JP Morgan creating their own crypto tokens and as well a lot of uh, the Chinese government is creating their own digital currency and the Japanese government is working on this. So how do you see that? And of course, you mentioned South Korea, that has been one of the biggest uh, crypto markets in the world, and Taiwan as well, actually. So how do you see this evolution in the last 10 years and the present stage? Right. Um, yeah, you mentioned about Libra. Actually, we also pay a lot of study on Libra, Libra's organization and how Libra can do and what Libra is trying to do. And we believe in China or maybe Asia are able to have some similar as Libra, okay? So because Libra is very easy, he just combine all the different business model company and serve different subscribers and they, they combine all this together, right? And provide the, uh, a uniform, a very unified service to them, uh, including the payment, including the, some kind of uh, certificate, including some kind of cross-border things, right? And we believe that kind of things can be happening in China as well. So in the next, not just 10 years, I would say in maybe in the next five years, three, five years, we can find something similar or we can try to incubate something similar in China, not likely, but that's one thing. And also we talk about the, the uh, central government's digital currency. We also believe uh, there are some companies are able to link the uh, central digital currency into a kind of virtual currency world. And there are some kind, some kind of company are able, to, if they are able to link these two, this kind of company are able to create a lot of value as well. Because nowadays, so, uh, so, so many, uh, uh, low, uh, so many the central government they are refuse the uh, pure virtual crypto, but they create cre create their own digital currency. That's not necessarily crypto, but digital currency. But these things now is still independent, still separate. So if some some kind of company, some kind of business model are able to combine it together, I believe they are also create a lot of, a lot a lot of more business models as well. And also in that next three, five years, as I mentioned earlier, right, the micro insurance, that will be a very huge, huge market. Because based on blockchain technology, everything can be customized, everything can be individual, right? Because everything, uh, everything simply is different, right? And the other thing that we are really focused on is that IoT stuff, I mentioned that too. Because today, the protocol blockchain itself is time step. So each block need to connect block and then connect a block together, right? So one by one, one by one. Also, this one by one, one by one is also the limitation about the, uh, the TPS transaction per second because you need to be one by one, one by one. You cannot in parallel 
okay? But for IoT application, the, the each sensor it, itself, the data provided by each sensor, maybe the timing sequence is not that critical, but location and position is, okay? Because the sensor itself, okay, I need to detect the, uh, the temperature of this room, I need to detect the uh, traffic light of this area. So the position location itself is so critical, but the time sequence may be the first, may, may not be the first prior, prior, priority. So we believe in the future there are another algorithm, which is going to be different from the blockchain today, which is time step. Create another scheme, another algorithm. That's, we, that's why we believe it's going, going to have a huge, huge application based on that kind of structure in the future. I, I, I guess that will be happening in the next three years as well. No, completely. And I think this is kind of is going to be the, the new cutting edge. So Richard, the, where would the, for our audience around the world, where can actually they find information about you, about the Draper uh, Dragon Fund and uh, all the information that you want to promote here in our video podcast that is distributed all over the world? Right. I, I think it's easy. Just simply Google Draper Dragon or just look at your media, right? And we are easy to find. I believe so. If you look at the uh, Team Dreamers website and uh, say, okay, who, which phone is in China, we are easy to find. Very good. Well, thank you so much, Richard. I don't know if there's any other ideas or things you want to highlight, but it's been a fantastic journey. And I like a lot of insights, even for me, in terms of uh, demystifying all these different things and as well looking at the opportunities and, and as well uh, doing things with the right approach in terms of looking at facts and investment and as well technology. Thank you so much. Thank you too. Okay, thank you. Thank you.